Good morning, everyone. Let's uh, turn to the Bible as we begin today's sermon. Uh, Matthew chapter 12, beginning at verse 38, a translation from the wonderful uh, work of Eugene Peterson called The Message. A few religion scholars and uh, Pharisees got on Jesus. Teacher, they said, we want to see your credentials. Give us some hard evidence that God is in this. How about a miracle? Jesus said, you're looking for proof, but you're looking for the wrong kind. All you want is something to fascinate your curiosity, gratify your fixation on miracles. The only proof you're going to get is what looks like the absence of proof, Jonah evidence. Like Jonah, three days and nights in the fish's belly, the Son of Man will be gone three days and nights in a deep grave. On Judgment Day, the Ninevites will stand up and give evidence that will condemn this generation because when Jonah preached to them, they changed their lives. A far greater preacher than Jonah is here. That's the gospel of the Lord. Well, welcome everybody back to our summer reading series. It's um, so good to be able to share with you and teach in this series. I, uh, I love to read. In fact, right now, I uh, have open uh, either in a book on a table or on my screen five uh, books that uh, I'm in the midst of reading. Rodney Stark's The Triumph of Christianity, Howard Thurman's The Parables of Jesus, and three are biographies. Uh, of Elton John, St. Augustine, and Catherine the Great, I could use a little self-control in the reading department. But notice, as you think about these books that I'm either reading on my phone or um, from, a, from a book from the library, um, it's, uh, it's a book, a group of books, none of them are, are fiction. All of them are nonfiction. I don't really like to read make-believe stuff. Give me the real deal. Now, as you might hope, as a pastor, I also like to read the Bible. And, and therein lies a problem with my reading habits because Jesus told make-believe stories all the time. In fact, if you study the Bible and, and read the, the Bible, uh, the length of the books, the 66 books, are fin filled with many stories that uh, make belief. In fact, it seems pretty honest, uh, pretty evident that, that Jesus realized that as he told stories, um, the things that he was revealing about God could not possibly be contained in a lecture. I mean, think about the stories that Jesus told, your favorite stories, the prodigal son, the uh, shepherd that had 100 sheep and one of them lost and he left the 99, um, the, the story of the Good Samaritan, or maybe uh, the story Jesus told of the man who uh, realized he had so much wealth, so much stuff, he didn't know what to do. And so he said, what am I going to do with all this? I'm going to go build a bigger barn, which seemed to make sense to him until later that same day he heard from God uh, telling him that uh, his time was up. These stories that Jesus told, they, they got into you, and they, they, they literally make believe. They, they create faith in us because God knew, Jesus knew, that these stories uh, contained the wisdom of the kingdom of God. They, they uh, told the facts of eternity in a great story. That's what happened that day. The, the um, Pharisees and, and those religious scholars who cornered Jesus and asked for, for a miracle and, and and he said, the only sign you're going to see is, uh, well, he, he referred to his favorite Bible story, the story of Jonah and the whale. Well, it's, a, uh, it's an opportunity for us to think about the stories. So the story I lift up today is a prayer for Owen Meany. It's um, described as the best book by the incredibly 
prolific and popular author John Irving. Uh, a Prayer for Owen Meaning uh, is a book that has uh, plenty of religion and Bible in it, but don't let that put you off. Uh, it also has a lot of stories that will make a pious Christian wince. Have I piqued your interest yet? The, um, the opening line of the book is this. I am doomed to remember a boy with a wrecked voice, not because of his voice or because he was the smallest person I ever knew or even because he was the instrument of my mother's death, but because he is the reason I believe in God. What you need to know about Owen Meany is that he was different uh, in all kinds of ways from any of the kids his age. First of all, physically, he was uh, small, uh, tiny. Uh, even as an adult, he never reached five feet tall. Uh, and he had big ears that stuck out and a pointy nose and uh, pale, translucent skin. He looked more like an old man than a, a little kid. And, and that voice, something was wrong from birth with his larynx. And so when he would speak, it was high-pitched and nasal. And, um, and it wasn't just the physical things that made Owen Meany different. He, he was remarkable and, and probably most striking is that he always believed himself to be an instrument of God. He, he thought that his life was for some purpose, uh, perhaps even some extraordinary purpose, and the book is filled with the uh, hilarious, gut-wrenching episodes where this theme is lived out. Owen Meany is uh, heartwarming and ultimately heartbreaking. But I'm not going to give away the end of the story. I am going to tell you about um, his experience at church, uh, Christ Church, a medium-sized city and nondescript church by any means where Owen was very active uh, one of the early stories in the books is from Sunday school class where the teacher turns his back to do some teaching against a chalkboard and uh, the, one of the children pick up little tiny Owen and begin to pass him over the, each other's heads as though they were uh, passing a rock star at a rock concert. And Owen uh, absolutely not saying a word because he was not going to let them have the satisfaction of harassing him. In fact, the more the kids harassed him, even at church, the stronger he seemed to become. He could deal with it, and he overcame all of that, which um, sets the stage for uh, chapter 4 of the book, which is titled, The Little Lord Jesus. It's the uh, season of the annual Christmas program, and, and Owen declares to his friend Johnny Wheelwright, who's the narrator of the book telling all the story of this prayer for Owen Meany. Owen declares to his friend Johnny Wheelwright, this year I am not going to be the baby Jesus, which uh, was quite a bold statement for Owen to, to make, putting his foot down, because uh, for a number of years that had been his part. Uh, Mrs. Wiggins... The director of the program, the wife of the dear right Reverend Dudley Wiggins, had always said, Owen, no one it would be cuter for this role than you to be the Christmas angel in this program. And, um, and Owen is, is putting his foot down because uh, Christ Church, for all of its uh, being a, a regular kind of a congregation, had a rather elaborate dimension in their annual Christmas program, and that was the, the Christmas angel would descend from the heavens suspended by wires from something like a, a uh, crane-like apparatus and almost as a puppet would have that clarion moment in every Christmas program when those words were announced, 
Behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Those were the, uh, that was the lyric or the message that, uh, that Owen announced that each year suspended from the heavens, but this year he said he would not which uh, threw Mrs. Wiggins into uh, a quandary. How would she cast the play? She went to consult with her husband, the right Reverend Dudley, and he made an appearance at the rehearsal and, and asked Owen what the problem was. And Owen said he had had enough of those snarky shepherds and Joseph who were always looking up at him and smirking at him throughout the play. Well, that persuaded the Reverend Wiggins to say that uh, this wasn't uh, to be allowed, and in fact, Owen had a part, had a point. Maybe it was time to give the Christmas angel role to someone else. At which point, Owen announced, "And this year, I will be the little Lord Jesus." Well, that was a, another uh, quite bold statement, given the tradition that was in this church Christmas pageant, they were quite committed to um, realism. In fact, we've been talking about our Christmas programs at Atonement lately, and I, I think that we've made a big sh change. It, it appears that we're, we're about to uh, look into the presence of a live creature, uh, given the realism of the Christmas pageant. Um, you, you can check with Ann and Kara on that. I know Pastor Kevin's been lobbying for the presence of a, a llama, but he admits as well that really there weren't llamas in the Middle East, so maybe that might be a stretch, but you can stay tuned and find out and, and see if we become like this uh, Christ church in a prayer for Owen Meany, committed to the realism of the Christmas pageant. Uh, their tradition was that they had a real baby Jesus in the manger throughout the program. But they were also committed to uh, the realism that was depicted in the hymn that was sung as the baby Jesus made his entrance away in a manger, which has that time-tested uh, verse, uh, a little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes, which is a problem because, as we know, uh, little babies and children aren't always able to maintain silence. So here's how they solved this problem at Christ Church. They, they had a lot of babies waiting in the wings. Uh, parents were recruited, and in those days of the baby boom generation, there were lots of babies, any baby boomers out there. And so whenever the baby Jesus in the Christmas pageant at Christ Church would begin to squabble and cry, another would be passed in to take its place. They had kind of a parent and baby fire drill that went on, and, and many popular Many kid, uh, parents thought this was a place they wanted their, their baby to take their few moments of fame. In the Christmas program, Owen announced, This year I will be the baby Jesus. I fit into the crib and I know how to be quiet. <laughs> Which actually Mrs. Wiggins didn't find to be so bothersome after all because it had become quite a challenge to recruit and organize all those parents and figure out the pecking order of which baby got passed first and second and third. And, oh, this took a lot off of her plate. Speaking of hymns, there was a tradition in that church during the pageant that they would sing all the verses. And Owen, uh, who now was becoming sort of the de facto director of the program, asserting himself as he was, said, where in the Bible does it say we need to sing all the verses? And, and he encouraged them to look at the, the hymn, for example, that they always sang at the grand entrance of the, the three kings. And, and the insistence on the three verses, he said, look at that fourth verse. Do you really want us to be singing, the, the, all of us in the congregation, at the moment that we are welcoming the joyous presence of the Christ child? Do we sing that fourth verse? sorrowing, sighing, bleeding, dying, laid in a stone-cold tomb, which they agreed maybe they could go without that verse. That wasn't the last uh, innovation that Owen had in mind. The tradition of uh, arranging the characters in the play 
always began with the selection of Mary, the key uh, role that was seen at, as part of the play. And, and Mary was always chosen first, and, and, and Owen again asserted himself, why do we always choose Mary first? And he went on to argue that Joseph, for example, was always treated like an afterthought. He always got short shrift. Why couldn't Joseph be chosen first, he argued. He said, I nominate Johnny Wheelwright to be Joseph, which uh, took everyone aback and uh, surprised Johnny, who I remind you was the, is the narrator of all of this story, who found himself thrust into the, the role of, of, of Joseph, which came with some baggage because the tradition was that Whereas Mary, when chosen, would select Joseph and all the other characters would fall into place. Now Joseph had the responsibility of choosing his Mary. Which if you imagine being in the fourth grade and, and, and being the boy that's supposed to choose the Mary isn't the place that you want to be. I mean, in fact, J uh, Johnny did have his Mary in mind. He had had a crush on her for a long time, but he wasn't about to inform her of that at that moment. And what would happen if by all that everybody knew now that, well, this wasn't going to happen, but he had to make a choice, which presented him with a further quandary of, how do I make a choice amongst all of the Marys that are standing there worthy and wanting to be chosen for this key role. He couldn't win for losing. What was he going to do? Well, he consulted privately with Owen, and they came up with a plan, and, and Johnny announced that Mary Beth Baird would be this year's Mary. Mary Beth Baird, a wholesome lump of a girl, shy and um, very clumsy, but... When Mrs. Wiggins consulted with her husband, he thought that she would be a fine choice. Well, they reached the dress rehearsal, and if you've ever been involved in a Christmas program and a dress rehearsal, you know what bedlam ensues. It was a house of fire with parents and children running around and costumes being fitted and everyone uh, in, in, a, in a, a sense of chaos and, and nothing coming together. Uh, Harold Crosby, the new angel, was safely suspended from the above, and after a few tries, he managed to get his Behold, I Bring You Tidings line mostly right, and they kept going through it, and um, there in the hay lay... Owen, uh, faking sleep, or maybe he, he was asleep. Nobody knew or cared. At least he was being quiet, and nothing was working until it did. And they got through the dress rehearsal, and Mrs. Wiggins was so shocked that things came together that she blurted out, I think we should go through this one more time at which point Owen sat up from the manger and said, I think we got it just right. <laughs> Getting it just right. How are we doing in that? How are we doing in life? Getting it just right. We try so hard. We come together on Sunday mornings out of our harried lives, so disparate and uh, disjointed, often by so many things. And Jesus says, let me tell you a story. And he tells us over and over uh, the old, old story, the story of the wonder and the awe of God that can't possibly be fully contained in any book or any description or any history or any doctrine. Let me tell you a story. Now Jesus says, 
that he hopes will get into us. Something that we won't get over anytime quickly. Something that will live in us for eternity that we will become instruments of God. That we will have a prayer. That we will know the love and the joy and the wisdom of God our Creator.